distinct pleasure to welcome to the airwaves Guy Blues. He's the author of How Angels Die, which was published earlier this year. Guy, welcome to the program, and uh, congratulations on your, your book's success already. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, uh, before we welcome uh, Randall, our, our friend, um, just tell us a little bit, Guy, about what inspired you to write this story uh, about a man who wishes to die at, at such a young age. What, what compelled you to write something like this? Well, actually, um, the story is uh, uh, my story. Um, I wrote it uh, um, over a period of about seven years. I, um, when I was a young man, my brother contracted an illness, and um, I ended up watching him die in a very sad and slow death. Um, my initial reaction to it was, I'm going to become a priest, and I'm going to right the wrongs of the world. And, and when I got into my teens, I suddenly um, swung, my pendulum swung the other side, and I was like, why would a God do this to my little innocent brother? And I just, I, I'd seen my parents and my grandparents get old, and I just decided, you know, when I'm, when I'm 37, that's it. I'm, I've reached the peak of my life, and I'm just going to end it all. And I kind of liked the idea of having a, almost like a sell-by date. I, I knew I had to achieve everything by that date. And when I was in my early 30s, um, I met a wonderful young lady, and she um, sort of knocked me off my feet. And we'd been together about six months, and she told me that she had MS mm. and uh, was very scared that it was going to frighten me away. But because I'd, um, I don't know whether it was because I'd been through my brother's illness, I just, it didn't frighten me at all. Um, we ended up getting married, and she got to, to, she got to the um, age of 35, and I was actually 37 at the time. And she just said, I can't live like this. Like, you know, her body was closing down. And she just decided that she had to die. She couldn't um, be, as she called it, a burden. And she wanted to uh, end her life. And she didn't know how to do it. And she sort of enlisted me to help her. Um, and I went through the process with her of watching her attempt to commit suicide a few times before finally succeeding. And that's why um, the book's called How Angels Die, A Confession. Um, and I, I mean, to me, it's a, obviously a story of um, it's devastating, but it's also inspiring. You know, it's about love and what you do for someone you love unconditionally and deeply. And sometimes in life, you, if, if you love someone that much, you get put into a situation where whatever you do, you're going to lose them. But you have to do what's right for them and not what's right for you necessarily. Now, Guy, are you living stateside? Yes, I am. All right. So, uh, I'm, I'm actually a citizen. Okay. Well, I, I, <laughs> with, with a funny accent. <laughs> no, that, that's all right. Uh, now, of course, I, I, here in America, we we are you know we're we're facing in in many different states the question of uh, whether or not to have physician assisted suicide. Uh, does does your story and, and have you been inspired to to advocate for those causes in in different states? Yeah, I mean, obviously, my, my story is the classic example of what happens when you don't allow physician-assisted suicide because um, you end up having to, either, you know, in my case, I had to assist somebody doing it. But in Gemma, my wife's case, she actually had to um, work out the way to do it. And it was a horrible, painful, devastating process in the sense that ultimately she had to be on her own to die. And, um, of course, I completely advocate for uh, the right to die, um, because it would have meant that she could have had her family surrounding her, we could have been by her side, we could have been holding her hands and sort of aiding her peacefully into into you know the ever after. And as it was, because California doesn't allow that, um, and it doesn't allow it in the case of MS, because MS isn't counted as a terminal illness, although it completely devastates your life and, and, and renders you incapable of looking after yourself, mm. so it is terminal in one sense. Um, we were unable to do that, so I had the, you know, the very painful process of watching somebody uh, dying in her mind and and wanting to die and being you know, having to literally at the end of the, at the very last minute leave her to do it on her own, which is obviously something that still rings very hard in my life because I had to um, to, to walk away and I didn't want to. I wish I could have been there and just lain by her side and, and, and helped her through that transition. Without giving too much away, Guy, what message was sent to you as, uh, you know, you had planned to end your own life, but you were, you were given somebody who had uh, her own 
uh, health issues and who in the end felt very much the same way that you did at the outstart. I mean, how did that affect you? Uh, it affected me immensely. I, I um, you know, I, I've been very sort of, uh, sort of, I mean, Randall will tell you, I was very sort of relaxed about it. It's like, it's cool. I'm just going to, you know, when I'm 37, I'll just end it all. It's not a problem. And then obviously watching uh, Gemma go through this, I... She, she. One of the very last things she said to me was, um, you know, she was. We were just face to face, and she just said, "I just, I want you to be happy, and just please try and live for me." And that really, you know, I was. I'm completely healthy. Uh, obviously, maybe not mentally, but I'm, I am completely healthy in my body. I'm, I'm very fit. I'm very privileged. I'm, you know, I'm a lucky, successful, happy person. You know, I, I'm, I remember both Gemma and my mother always used to tell me that I sleep with a smile on my face and I wake up in a good mood. And so it wasn't out of a depression that I'd wanted to die, but when, once I saw Gemma go through that and once she said that to me, you know, it, 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 again, my, my whole aspect was flipped and I, and I suddenly was like, yeah, I, sh I should live, I can live, I, I should enjoy this beautiful world that we live in and, and um, do the best I can. And if, 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 if for the very least, just to, sort of in, in the sense of Gemma's message and Gemma's memory, to, to live for her and, and enjoy my life in the way that she was not able to. How, how did that affect your faith, this entire journey? And, and what, what do you subscribe to now? Oh, it's, very, it's very difficult for me. I mean, I, I think I subscribe, my faith is love. You know, just, I just, it's very hard for me to um, watch religions fighting over details. And I just think that every religion... Uh, pretty much um, advocates the same thing, which is do as you would be done by and love thy neighbor. And I think that's ultimately in life, just be kind and be loving. And it does. If you, if you go to a church and pray, you go to a church and pray. And if you don't, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, I think a lot of the time we're sort of made to feel that if you're not following a specific religion, there's something wrong with you or you're a bad person. I think that it's just about your actions rather than your words. I think, you know, in many cases, we find that the, the most religious people, their actions are just so strange and so unloving and so against their religion. And then other people who aren't religious, their actions are com completely giving and, and freeing and devoted to other people. So I just think it's really about your actions more than your words. So I don't subscribe to anything in particular, apart from my guess to boil it down to one word, it would just be love. It doesn't have to be complicated at all. And, and I think you've uh, boiled it down to the right word. Uh, let's welcome to the conversation we have Randall Battenkoff. Randall, welcome to the program. How are you today? Um, I'm well, Taylor. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Randall, how, uh, tell me how you and Guy became acquainted and, and how this relationship developed into uh, what it is today. About 12 years ago, uh, a girl I was dating invited me to see uh, this show at the Mint in Hollywood, a music club, and Guy Blues was performing with his band Monroe. He was quite good. Uh, very charismatic, and he was covered in tattoos, which I found very fascinating. I, I met Guy after the show, and I was intrigued with his tattoos, and particularly the 37 on his arm, which I asked him about, and he told me that that was how old he was going to be when he died. And I asked him how he knew that, and he said because he was going to kill himself when he turned 37. And we became friends, and... I remained obviously very fascinated with the tattoo and the fact that here's somebody who's going to, you know, kill himself when he turns 37. And I, I just wanted to understand it, and I realized that it had uh, something to do with the death of his younger brother, who had died, as Guy told you, many years earlier. And Guy wanted to make sure that something like that couldn't happen to him. And I tried to talk him out of it. And he would laugh. He'd say, you know, there's nothing you can do. It's basically, it's set in stone. And we lost touch. And <clears throat> he was 36 at the time. And about a year or so later, I ran into him at, at Gold's Gym. And he was alive and well. And clearly had passed his 37th birthday, which he had said yes. He was 38 at the time. And I asked him what happened to 37. I was obviously very happy to see him. Uh, and he said that uh, he had chickened out. He had still too much to live for. He didn't want to devastate his mother and such. And then I asked him about his girlfriend, and he told me that she had died. And I asked him how, and he told me that she killed herself. And then Guy told me the details, which were just mind-blowing. And I 
I knew that it would make an incredible film, and uh, I felt that the story needed to be shared with people and told. And Guy and I started, you know, talking about the movie and working on the screenplay while Guy was writing the book. And it's been a 12-year journey, and now the book is out. The movie, 37, A Final Promise, is now out. It came out in August in New York and L.A., and it's now on video on demand, iTunes and Amazon, and it's selling internationally, and we've got a Blu-ray coming out as well early uh, next year. So people are seeing the movie, and the response to the story has just been absolutely incredible. So many people have come forward just talking about how this movie has healed them. So many people have shared similar type stories where they've had to help loved ones transition, and they've had to do it sort of, in many cases, sort of under, you know, the the support of obviously society and others. So it's been, uh, this, this movie's been very cathartic for them. And uh, I would imagine very personal for the both of you. Uh, what was it like taking your friend's story and putting it to a screenplay? Uh, it was pretty intense. I mean, it was a very sensitive story, obviously. The, the subject matter is as is, is challenging as one could encounter. And having Guy be a willing participant was obviously the the thing that enabled the whole thing to happen. He wanted to share the story, and we wanted to do it justice and tell it in a way that made it sort of acceptable, so people could could take it in. I mean, it's really it's a it's a harrowing, tragic, and yet incredibly beautiful story. And the book, so the book How Angels Die, really tells the true story. The movie Thirty Seven, A Final Promise, is the poetic version. The the movie version, so to speak. It, it hits all the same main points, but it, in some ways it's almost the version that Guy wished he could have had. Uh, you know, I don't want to give away the movie, but it's not nearly as, uh, I want to say, gruesome in some of the, the details. It's, 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 it's a beautiful, beautiful story that's very moving. Um, yeah, but, but the journey has been really sort of incredible. I must uh, th say. There, uh, Randall, you know, there's a purpose to everything. What purpose do you think uh, the book, the movie, this whole story serves? Well, I think more than anything, it raises the question, what would you do? What do you do when the people you love get sick? And what do you do when the people you love actually don't want to confront the, their deterioration? and see themselves sort of dissipate. And it's really a question that no one really wants to address. So I think more than anything, it, it makes you think about things that unfortunately will happen at some point in your life. And it, I think it forces you to start thinking about them and I guess preparing yourself and really digging deep about what what's important to you. and. Uh, I'd say more than anything, and Guy has already sort of suggested it, it really is, it's about love. It's like, what, what do we do for the people we love? What, what really attracted me to the story more than anything is, and is the love that Guy had for, for his brother and how that love had you know, manifested into Guy's own death wish. And ultimately what I find so amazing about the story is that he's, he's forced to confront illness again and it's in his confrontation of it and because of his his enormous love for both his brother and his and his wife that he does really the unthinkable and you know and he's and he's lived to share it so guy it doesn't sound like you were too shy about this this promise you had made to yourself at all i mean what was family reaction from family and friends initially i mean i, I think everyone was pretty much like randall they couldn't believe it like why would you do that i don't get it i don't understand it um, but as Randall actually pointed out, it was one of those things where I just, I never, I'd seen my brother go through it and I just never wanted to go through any illness. I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be sick. You know, I wouldn't have to confront pain. I wouldn't have to think about it. If I just knew that that was it, then that was it. And there's nothing I could do about it. And I was going, I was in control. I mean, I am, a, I'm, I'm quite, I'm a neat freak. I love to be in control of things. I love to be, I'm very organized. So it was, for me, it was almost, I mean, the emotion almost wasn't there. It was almost became this practical sort of, well, if I do that, then I don't ever have to confront this and this and this. And so it, it for me, seemed completely logical at the time. And in a weird way, if I, if I argue it practically and logically, it is a logical argument. However, of course, when you actually get there and you have to confront it, it's a very, very difficult thing to confront. And I think, and this is actually... 
there's two things I wanted to say. One of you asked me about, you know, my sort of beliefs now. One of the things I, that Gemma and I would always discuss was how, you know, we sort of, we, we say that you can't play God with human life. You know, when you can, someone's dying, you've got to let, let it go through the process. But we would always say it's so strange how we play God with human life at the beginning of our lives and we extend our lives to, you know, as people are living into their 80s and 90s. And I mean, I remember my great aunt, she was 95, begging the doctors, please just let me go. I'm in pain. I'm miserable. I just don't want to be here anymore. I've lived my life. And of course, the Hippocratic Oath didn't allow them to help her. This was in England. But it was just, it was a very interesting argument to me that, that we, we do sort of one end of the scale. We do everything we can to keep ourselves alive. But when it comes to letting someone transition peacefully and comfortably, we seem so resistant to it. And I thought that was a, a, a very interesting um, sort of side of the argument, and that is put forward in the book and, and in the movie, that, you know, what do you do when you're in that untenable position of somebody who's in extreme pain and extreme ang mental anguish, and how do you let that person go and, and confront that? And, and as Randall said, you know, it is something we will have to confront, whether it's, our, it, it, it's, a, it's a great aunt or a grandparent or a parent or a child or yourself. Or your loved one it's a, it's a it's an awful question to think about but it is something that at some stage with, with the the extension of human life that we do have to address and i think that you know the way randall's done the movie um 37 a final promise you you get to see you see it visually really the deterioration of somebody and the love that somebody is showing to that person and and the anguish they go through and in how angels die a confession it's just it's it is the brutal, raw story. And I, I think it is, it's a very interesting subject matter. It's a very challenging subject matter. It's something that, you know, it was, it's hard for me to talk about, but it's also hard for me to confess because, in, you know, I'm right on the edge. I'm, I'm on that fine line of legal and illegal. And really, it shouldn't be a question of legal and illegal. It should be a question of happiness and pain or, or love and anguish you know that it shouldn't be that difficult for us to, to allow somebody to decide i can't live like this and my life is in is agony and it, you know it's it but it's not easy to discuss and people don't want to discuss it and everybody wants to leave it till the last minute and then go well, what do we do what do we do you know someone is on life support and we're too scared to make a decision mm. and i think it's you know it is it is almost it's decision time it's time for us as a as a as a race to be able to confront death without fear and, and accept it without fear. Uh, I think we can wrap up on that note because that was absolutely perfect. Uh, of course, you can log on to the movie37.com. That's the movie and the numbers 37.com for more information about Randall's film based on Guy Blues's uh, book and his real life story, How Angels Die, a confession which is available on Amazon. Gentlemen, any last words that you'd like to uh, part with our audience with? Randall? Thank you for having us, Taylor. I really appreciate having this conversation. I think it's very important for us to be talking about these things as, as uncomfortable as they are. So I really appreciate you uh, putting us on the air. Well, I appreciate to the both of you for the, the work you're doing and uh, the message that you're, you're spreading. It's uh, extremely important. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Randall and Guy Blues, for appearing here on WBSM. Uh, again, the movie37.com and Amazon.com for How Angels Die, A Confession.